Hi, I'm Becky Stern, and today we are demystifying data sheets. Keep watching to understand how to read one and how they can help you choose the right components as well as the best ways to use that part in your project. Let's get started. A data sheet serves as a user manual for a particular electronics component. When you first look at one, you might be overwhelmed. I know I was. There's so much technical info because engineers are the target audience, not beginners. But densely packed as they are, every electronics component has a data sheet full of useful info. And I hope by the end of this video, they'll be your new best friend. Data sheets serve up the important facts about a specific component, such as its electrical characteristics, pin configuration, and physical dimensions. Often, you'll also get graphs showing the part's performance under different conditions, and more advanced integrated circuits will include timing diagrams, truth tables, or instructions for programming, depending on what's relevant. You don't need to understand every section of the data sheet to find the information you want. Data sheets reminded me of word searches, where I had to siphon through the gibberish to find the right info. For example, I want to use this LED in my project. And I know it needs a resistor, but I don't know what value resistor to use. So I look to the data sheet to find the info I need, the forward voltage and the forward current of the LED. Then I plug those values into Ohm's law to calculate its appropriate resistor for my circuit. I don't need to know, for example, the chemical makeup of the LED. I can skim over and go to the section that contains the information I need. When I was just starting out, this particular concept was a bit of a challenge for me. I have since learned that this is a common sentiment for beginners, so that's why I'm mentioning it so early in this video. First up, you need to know where to find a parts data sheet. Usually, the place you bought it will have a link to the data sheet right on the product's webpage. Otherwise, if you don't know where the part came from, you can search the name or the number of the part plus the word data sheet. When I'm doing teardowns, sometimes all I have to go by are the markings on the IC, which are not always the same as the part number, but can often help with the data sheet search. Once you open the data sheet, notice that the first page contains high level info about the component, a list of its essential features, and its voltage and power specs. This is usually where you'll find what you're looking for when you're shopping or otherwise picking out parts for your project. You may notice that your data sheet references a series of components rather than just one. Often, data sheets will group similar parts, sometimes because a particular component is available in a different package size, or sometimes it's because it's a part of a series with a lot of similarities. So next, you'll need to identify which variant is yours so you can narrow down its particular info. One of the most important sections you'll run into is called the absolute maximum ratings. It's basically the do not exceed list for your component. These are the limits the manufacturer says the part can withstand without immediate damage, like the highest voltage or temperature it can handle. But these are not the recommended values for normal use. They're the danger zone. So you can't design a circuit to operate at these max values and expect your component to hold up long term. These are the values that can risk letting out the magic blue smoke. So treat this section as a warning label. Right next to, or sometimes right below, the absolute maximum ratings, you'll find the recommended operating conditions. These are the sweet spots where your component is designed to perform reliably. This section usually includes things like the supply voltage range, the input signal levels, and the operating temperature. When you're designing a circuit, these are the numbers you want to stick to to get your component to behave reliably and how you expect. Another key section is called the pin configuration, sometimes called the pinout diagram. This is where you will find a labeled map of what each pin on your component does. It's essential for wiring up things correctly. For simple components like an LED, it's pretty straightforward, but for ICs with dozens of pins, the diagram helps you decode which ones are for power, ground, inputs, outputs, communication lines, and more. You'll often see both a visual layout and a table listing each pin with its name, number, and function. When I'm breadboarding or laying out a PCB, this is the page I'm constantly referencing. Data sheets are particularly useful for designing a printed circuit board, or PCB. We covered PCB basics in a previous episode of this series, so go check that out if you're new to this. 
The data sheet will contain drawings of the component with physical dimensions, like the size and the spacing of the pins. So you can create accurately matching pads and mounting holes in your circuit design. Realistically, the software you will use probably has most of the common parts and packages available for you, so you don't need to recreate the footprints by hand most likely, but it's always a good idea to double check that the software version matches the measurements in the data sheet. Learning to read and navigate data sheets will make you a lot more confident when selecting parts for your next project. And they can provide answers when troubleshooting too. I also believe it marks a pretty big jump from beginner level electronic skills to intermediate. With that said, let's go through a few real world examples. Here's a data sheet for a standard five millimeter red LED. Say I wanna use this in a simple circuit with a battery and a resistor. I start by looking at the forward voltage, listed here as typically 2.1 volts, with a maximum of 2.6 volts at 20 milliamps. That's the voltage drop I'll use in my Ohm's law calculation to size the current limiting resistor. The recommended forward current is 20 milliamps, which will provide optimal brightness without pushing the LED too hard. The absolute maximum forward current is 30 milliamps, and the peak is even higher at 100 milliamps in pulsed mode. But again, we don't wanna run that close to the edge. We can see that this LED's viewing angle is 35 degrees, which is fairly directional. I also love checking the graphs. This one shows how the current increases steeply with voltage and how brightness scales with current. All this helps me design a circuit that's safe, efficient, and performs the way I expect. So if I do the math with this LED's forward voltage and a 4.5 volt battery pack, I need to subtract the forward voltage from the supply voltage to get V in my Ohm's law equation, divide that by the LED's recommended forward current to get the size of the ideal resistor in ohms. Since we know there's some wiggle room around the recommended current range, it's okay to round to the next nearest common resistor value. So if you've got a 100 ohm or a 220 ohm resistor, those would both work fine. Now let's look at an example using this PIR motion sensor, which is super beginner friendly. It acts like a digital switch that flips high when motion is detected and low when it's idle. The data sheet tells us the output is three volts when triggered and it works with a supply voltage of five to 12 volts. This is the perfect match for most microcontrollers logic, which is usually either three or five volts. Reading the data sheet lets us know that after we hook it up to power, ground, and signal pins on our Arduino or other microcontroller and power it on, we should wait 30 to 60 seconds for the sensor to stabilize before the reading will be reliable. When motion is detected, the output goes high, and we can read that from any digital IO pin. The data sheet also covers things like re-triggering, which is where the signal stays high as long as there's motion, or doesn't, depending on the position of this jumper. And it tells us that the two small potentiometers on the board, also called trim pots, control the timeout duration and the sensitivity. From the data sheet, we also learn how important the domed plastic lens is to increasing the range of the sensor. We're also shown an example circuit and Arduino code example to get up and running. The code examples are above and beyond for a data sheet on this one. Okay, let's look at one more example. This is the data sheet for one of my favorite microcontrollers to use, the Arduino Nano ESP32. The data sheet says that the VIN, or voltage input, can accept six to 21 volts. So I could power the board from a variety of different battery packs or wall adapters. The data sheet also lists the current limits, so I know the GPIO pins can only deliver up to 28 milliamps of current each. This would explain by wiring up one LED works fine, but adding more results in problems. The pinout section tells me which pins to use when hooking up I2C or SPI devices. Admittedly, I will reference microcontrollers pinout diagrams more frequently than their full data sheets. But when you're working with a powerful board like this one, the data sheet is more than just specs. It's your roadmap to all the device's capabilities. Now onto a few more advanced sections that might be included in a parts data sheet depending on what it is. If your data sheet includes a truth table, you're likely dealing with a digital logic component like a multiplexer or a logic gate. A truth table shows you how the outputs respond to different combinations of inputs, showing you the cause and effect. Each row represents a different input condition and the corresponding output tells you what the chip will do in that situation. It's super helpful for wrapping your head around how a part behaves before you even hook it up. Thanks, data sheet. 
Timing diagrams show how voltage levels change over time for different pins on digital components that rely on clock signals or communication protocols. For example, a timing diagram might show when data is read or written, or how long a reset pulse needs to be. If you're using a component with a precise sequence of events, like a shift register or memory chip, this diagram is your roadmap. It can look intimidating at first, but once you learn to read the lines like a musical score, it starts to make sense. I find them especially helpful when debugging. I can compare what I see on my oscilloscope or logic analyzer to what the timing diagram says should be happening. Data sheets often include plots and graphs to show how a component behaves under different conditions, like temperature, voltage, or frequency. These can look a little abstract at first, but they're incredibly helpful for understanding performance trends. For example, an LED might have a graph showing how its forward voltage drops slightly as temperature increases, or a transistor's gain may vary with collector current. These visualizations help you predict what your part will do in the real world. Plots and graphs help you design smarter and avoid surprises later. And there you have it, a beginner's guide to data sheets. Knowledge is power. I hope this video gives you the confidence to use them effectively. I've put links to some more resources in the description. Leave your advice and questions in the comments so we can all learn together. Check out the playlist with the rest of the series and subscribe to be sure you don't miss the next one.